Welcome, my friends, to the Sage Aquay Radio Hour, your home for free and critical thinking, and I'm your host, Mike Williams. Returning to the show tonight is my very special guest, Priscilla Volkelbaca. Priscilla is the author of the book, Hallowed Be Thy Name, Lucifer, Origins, and Revelation. She is a researcher and an expert in the mythologies of the Mesopotamia and Abrahamic religions, focusing on the character and concept of Lucifer. In today's discussion, Priscilla will explain how the terms Luciferian, Satanic, and Demonic are being used based on Christian concepts and how this usage is applied incorrectly by many in the truth and alternative research communities to define acts of evil. Based on Priscilla's work and expertise in mythology, there is no basis or foundation from a mythological perspective for Lucifer, Satan, or demons being evil entities or engaged in evil acts. This discussion for some people will be highly controversial, but if one keeps an open and critical mind, I think you'll find the dialogue fascinating. And to kick this conversation off, Priscilla explains why she felt it was important to cover this topic. And so without further ado, here's Priscilla. I've been listening to people talk about conspiracy stuff. I usually do. And these days it's all about the Pizzagate scandal between the emails uh, of John Podesta and Hillary Clinton. And it apparently gets into this comet ping pong place that allegedly is a hot spot for child uh, molestation by uh, the elites. And one of the things that got me is not all of that, but when people just throw out terms to associate with this behavior, like Satan, it's satanic, it's Luciferian, it's demonic. And I don't think these people understand what these terms actually mean. They're using it colloquially, but if you use it colloquially, you, you don't know what it means. It's just proving it. Now, let's start with the concept of demons. A demon is, uh, if you ask anybody, they'll say it's a minion of Satan. And that's fair enough, but what you're missing is the actual etymology of the word, what it, what it means. The word demon comes from the Greek word daemon or diamon. Um, and if I'm mispronouncing these non-English words, I apologize to anybody who's a linguist out there. Um, I'm just going to do the best I can with it. So demon comes from the Greek daimon, and diamon or diamones can be good or evil, depending on context and situation. From this word comes another Greek word, diamonion, which means a spirit. Colloquially, it's referred to as an evil spirit, but in actuality, uh, the Diamonians were nature spirits, and under the the uh, umbrella of Christianity, all of nature had become demonized, uh, including the nature gods and so forth. And so, from Diamonian, you know, we get the concept of spirits, and these are demons. The they're just nature spirits. That's really all they are. Um, now, who is the devil? Satan. Satan is a term, not a name. And in the Old Testament, Satan was a uh, title applied to any ambiguous angel appointed by Yahweh in Yahweh's court. And the Satan became the court prosecutor or the court appointed assassin. The, the term Satan in the New Testament is the Greek diabolos, or uh, which means literally accuser. And in the Septuagint, which is the original Greek translation of the Old Testament that was in the Library of Alexandria, it uses the word diabolos for Satan in the sense of an adversary or opponent. Now, these uh, being an adversary or an opponent of something is not necessarily evil. It just depends what you are opposing. And in the RSV translation, the Revised Standard Version of the Bible, uh, the Greek word diamon is transliterated as demon. So again, they put it back into that context, but it's a Christian perspective that a demon is uh, an evil being or an entity to do harm to people or other entities. That's a very Christian way of thinking. Now, the Satan, the great cosmic anti-god, 
is only found in the Old and New Testament in the temptation of Christ in the wilderness. And after fasting for 40 days, he induces through that fasting a delusion, a hallucination. And what manifests is this being allegedly being called Satan, uh, which is in actuality Jesus's shadow self, his true self, as it were. And again, if anybody has a question uh, to Satan being Jesus's true nature or true self, shadow self, go back to the end of the New Testament in Revelation 22, 16. Jesus himself says, I am the bright morning star. And if we go ask anybody in the church, they'll point to Isaiah and say, Lucifer is the morning star. And if Jesus says he's the morning star, then Jesus is Lucifer getting back to Satan as Jesus' shadow self. So are you equating Satan and Lucifer as the same thing? In the narratives, uh, yes. Okay. Satan and Lucifer are the, are the same being in the narratives. But from an esoteric perspective, Satan and Lucifer are different beings. Lucifer is pure light. It's, uh, it's a beacon of the goal of enlightenment. Satan as well. Satan is more of, you know, the adversary as, a, as I went into. He uh, stands for the opposition, and in most cases, the opposition is Christianity. Okay, so now also could we say that the opposition or Satan can be the adversary of Yahweh? Yeah. Okay, so we'll get back to that because I think that's a very important aspect of it that I was thinking through. So I'll let you finish here. Okay. Um, the One quick question. Now, when you say that Satan is, or Lucifer is Jesus's real true self, meaning? Yeah. In Jungian psychology, uh, it's called the shadow self. If somebody, um, and this ties in with the temptation narrative, everybody has demons inside of them. This is our own personal Satan, as it were. And we have to confront it because this demon is a gatekeeper to enlightenment. And unless we confront our own demons and wrestle with them and really figure out who we are and what we want out of life, uh, we're, we're probably not going to reach enlightenment, which is the higher self, the higher spiritual self. Okay, so it's a process of working through, I guess, and if I'm not using the right terms, just stop me, but working through the process of duality? It doesn't have to be dualistic, but it in the subject in and of itself inherently is the story of light versus dark, good versus evil, etc. And unfortunately, Satan has been portrayed in the past 2,000 years from preaching from the pulpit as an evil entity, as the dark side. You know, what they lack uh, is the facts behind all the words in the Bible, because taking the Bible as surface wisdom, it's hard to see any other perspective. But if you get into the meanings of words and the symbols of these deities, you'll see that the opposite is correct. And that like the Gnostics believed, Satan or the serpent uh, in Genesis is the good God. You know, he saved Adam and Eve. He didn't deceive them. Okay, so this will go back to, and I guess we can touch on this. Maybe we could do an abbreviated version of it. This goes back to the Anunnaki. It goes back to Enlil, who was Yahweh, and Enki, who is Lucifer. Right. Maybe we can explain a little of that in a little bit so that folks can understand what it is we're talking about, why it is that Lucifer is benevolent and Yahweh may not be. Sure. Okay. So now that we know what a demon is, esoterically a nature spirit, but in a narrative sense, it's a follower of Lucifer, a Luciferian, a um, one of the Anunnaki. And we'll, like you said, we'll get into that. But let's, on the opposite end of that, what is an angel? Uh, the word angel, the English word, comes from the Hebrew word malak, which means messenger. And 
that got translated into the Greek agelos. So an angel is just a messenger of God, uh, an emissary, basically a good soldier, as it were. Is it the messenger of the God or the messenger of a God? A God. And that God is Yahweh, Jehovah, Allah. And that goes back to the Babylonian and Sumerian mythologies where Enlil had the faction of Igigi, which was a uh, serving worker faction of the Anunnaki. So angels and demons are just two different titles applied to do two different factions of deities under the rule of two heads, Enki, which became Satan, and Enlo, which became Yahweh. And the uh, cognate with the the, the Malak, the Hebrew Malak, the messenger is cognate with the Arabic La'aka, which means to send on a mission. So they are literally soldiers of Enlil, soldiers of Yahweh. Angels do a lot of bad things in the Old Testament, if you read it. Well, that but, was going to be my question. My question mm -hmm. is that the demons and the angels, people look at angels and they think angels are all good. But angels, there could be angels that are serving the dark and then there are angels that are serving the light correct yeah but um demons in uh christian mythology are angels that have fallen from their moral precipice as it were but look at humans and human society if a soldier follows orders uh is that a good soldier yeah you know in the sense that the soldier is doing its job but if the one giving the orders is ordering the soldier to do something not good or purely evil like let's for example slaughter a village of people uh, and the soldier does that is the soldier good for doing that not really there's right. a moral conflict there you know just because um the term angel is applied to a being doesn't make it good. And well, the that's same like as... the old um, adage where a soldier who was engaged in something that wound up being evil or bad turns around and says, I was just following orders. That exactly. usually does not suffice if you're in court. We can go back to the Nuremberg trials as an example. <laughs> yeah, and just doing your job does not, in my opinion, relieve you of moral responsibility. Right. And you don't need, while we're on the subject of morality, I want to point out you don't need a religious uh, construct or a religious foundation to have a sense of what's right and wrong. If you don't know the good from the bad, then you don't lack religion, you lack empathy, you lack right. understanding. And you don't need any religion to gain that. That's an interesting point because I had mentioned to you previously that I have uh, had some discussions with folks and they will say that religion serves a very good purpose for many people because without religion and without, I guess, the fear of going to hell if you don't do the right things, according to that religious dogma, and I'll pick on Catholicism because I was a Roman Catholic way back when, that without religion, many folks would not be able to find the right path to be walking on. In other words, they would have trouble doing the right thing. They would end up doing the wrong thing. And thank yeah. God religion is there because it takes them off the wrong path vis-a-vis -vis fear. You're going to go to hell to force them to do the right thing. But my argument has always been that to do the right things doesn't have anything really to do with religion. Religion could not be there and you can still get people to do the right thing if people are educated and they are intellectually engaged and they are knowledgeable and they take that knowledge and they nourish it and they manifest wisdom. So in other words, you're a critical thinker, you're a free thinker. I have found, and I'm probably going to get some emails on this, but people who are not actively engaged in critically thinking they tend to want to rely on authority figures or establishment types of apparatuses and structures to keep them 
on whatever path they're on in life. So what I'm saying is you don't need all that stuff. If if you pursue intellectually your God-given gift of wanting to learn, to explore, that you will run your life and operate your life. You'll be very sovereign, very self-governing, and you're going to make the right choices and good choices and live by the golden rule, which is to do no harm. But again, that's just a, a discussion point that I have with people. I wanted to throw that in because you were kind of on that thread. You know, it, all evil ultimately comes from ignorance and, and good comes from knowledge. Uh, that's the message of the original sin in, in Eden and the Bible story there. I don't believe fear is a good motivator. I know it's effective. Uh, everybody knows it's effective. We see it all the time. But to do the right thing in fear of hell is a logical fallacy. Because, again, you have to go back into the Bible and look up the meaning of these words. And let's touch on hell for a second. The word hell comes from the word Gehenna. Every single instance in the canonic Gospels where Jesus uses the word hell, it is the word uh, Gehenna. It's a Hebrew word. And that comes from the word Gehenna which was the Valley of Hinnom surrounding the old city of Jerusalem in the ancient times. And in that uh, ravine, this ever-burning refuse heap, because uh, it, it was, people threw out dead carcasses, trash, everything. And it was the garbage dump of Jerusalem. And, but in the midst of that was an altar of towpath which people uh, used to make sacrifices to Moloch and to Baal. Baal is the head of the Canaanite pantheon, just below El. But in the Old Testament, those two, there's no distinction between them, and it's just transliterated as God or Lord or any generic title like that. Now, the people who sacrificed to Moloch, as the Bible tells us, they burn their children alive in, in his name. And let's tie this in with the conspiracy angle, uh, because a lot of people in the conspiracy movement use words like, you know, it's a satanic conspiracy, it's a Luciferian conspiracy. In the Bohemian Grove, in particular, there is a 40-some foot statue of an owl, and the owl is shared by many deities as a symbol. Many goddesses have it, a few gods have it, but Moloch in particular is of interest because of what happened in ancient Jerusalem. Because when we watch Alex Jones's documentary where he broke into it and filmed it secretly, we see these elites in their what look like Ku Klux Klan outfits, yeah. these pointed hat robes, and they do what's called a cremation of care ceremony, which they put all their care, which means all their guilt, into an effigy and burn it before this owl statue. Now, it's up for debate whether or not the person being burned is actually living. Now, what this is, is the exact sacrificing of children to Moloch that went on in the ancient times around Jerusalem. It's the same thing. So does that make it Luciferian or Satanic? Well, not necessarily, and I would say not at all, because Moloch, as well as Baal, are aspects of Yahweh, not Satan. And the Moloch, uh, the word Moloch, is phonetically related to the Hebrew word Malach, which was the Greek agalos, which became angel. So... It's very centered on Yahweh. It's not centered on Satan. But then we have things like Pizzagate and, uh, you know, the contents of what Pizzagate revealed is nothing new in the slightest. Um, there's been child trafficking rings for ages and ages. And I don't think that's going to go away anytime soon. But is it Luciferian? Is it Satanic? I would say no, because... Luciferianism, as a religion, 
is not negative. There's nothing negative about it. It's all about enlightenment. It's all about self-improvement. See, the Abrahamic religions teach self-sacrifice. That's the overarching message. And the religions of the adversary teach self-empowerment. And that's where I think a lot of confusion comes in with people. Um, because they're coming at this from the Abrahamic perspective of Lucifer is evil, Satan is evil. If Lucifer, Satan is evil, does that mean Jesus is evil? Well, no, Jesus is good. But Jesus is the reincarnated God. But if Jesus is Lucifer, doesn't that make Lucifer God? And I say, yes, it is. This is interesting. So going back to Baal for a second and Moloch, are they the same God? They're not the same deity, but they're two aspects of the same deity that comprises Yahweh. Okay, so Yahweh being El? Yeah, yeah. In the Canaanite pantheon, El and Baal are distinguished individuals, but in the Old Testament, there is no distinguishing. There's a lot of names for God taken from older pantheons and older mythologies that were used for God in the Old Testament, but when translated... Um, these individual names were simply put to generic terms like God and Lord and Most High and all these other appellations and epithets so that the populace was unable to distinguish the God, the uh, God of the universe, the um, Demiurgos, as it is, from the God of Earth, the one that walked in the Garden of Eden. These are very different concepts and very different uh, deities. Okay, so so really, maybe we should be calling some of this child sacrifice allegations and those types of things where we have uh, ritual types of uh, sacrifices. And this has been something that has been, been played out by many in the uh, conspiracy, in the alternative research community. It almost sounds to me like it should be called Malachism or Baalism versus a Luciferian agenda or a satanic agenda, because one of the questions I was going to ask you, Priscilla, is where did the definition of Lucifer or Satan, where did it get defined as evil? It does explicitly say that Satan is evil. And again, there's an obvious Satan-Lucifer identification. So in that respect, it does. But Lucifer taken on its on his own there's no nothing in the Bible to say that Lucifer is evil or bad at all. In fact, uh, with the Jesus tie that I went over before, Lucifer is good, and the Bible tells us. Even with Satan, though, it says in the Bible, it says that Satan is only bad because Satan convinced Eve to eat the forbidden fruit. Right, and he did. And he did, but the thing is, th then you really have to understand why was the fruit forbidden. That, I guess yeah. that's the point I'm on, right? Some yeah. people might just say, well, it's forbidden because in the Bible it says it's forbidden, so there you, know, there you go. End of discussion. But in my, my Christian studies and taking a look at those stories, I was reading it and thinking to myself, well, why is that fruit forbidden? It was forbidden just because Yahweh told them it was. Um, and the reason for that is that as um, extra-biblical sources state, when Eve and Adam subsequently ate of the fruit, their minds opened, their eyes right. opened. They became aware of their surroundings. And, and that's something Yahweh did not want to happen. He wanted uh, Adam and Eve to remain in the garden and in a life of thraldom as trophies. It's an appeal to authority. And yes. we see this in everyday life. People, you know, where do you... Where do you get your sources? Where do you get your information? Well, from this authority or that authority. And that can be good, uh, but only to a point. You know, if if our administration ordered something like, <laughs> which is possible, a Muslim res registry, you know, we can see a, a historical parallel with um, the armbands the Jews wore in Nazi Germany. You know, it's it's not it doesn't make it good because it comes from an authority. You know, yeah. you have to use your own moral compass and and know for yourself whether something is good or bad. 
Just because an authority figure tells you that something is good doesn't make it so. Just because a law is the law doesn't make it right or just. You know, or you moral, have to question right. things. Or moral, exactly. Right. Well, that's the, that's the point I was on because some people, when I said that in the Bible, it doesn't say that Satan was evil, they're going to say, yes, it does. And, I'm, and my point being is, but you have to read deeper into it. Why was he referred to as evil? Why was that fruit forbidden? What motive? That's where I was going with it. Right. And the serpent, though, the Hebrew word used for the serpent in the Eden story is nakash, which as a noun means serpent. As a verb, it means diviner. Um, and as an adjective, it means the shining one. So it all points to Lucifer, um, who, again, is Satan in the narrative. Um, but he liberated Adam and Eve. He didn't deceive them. It's a matter of perspective. You have to look at it from the other side. You know, if you're considering uh, any sort of crime, you have to get more than one source of information to come to a conclusion. Right. And I'm going to ask the folks, I'm, what I will do is uh, Priscilla and I have done two previous shows, and I'm going to include the links in the uh, show notes below so that you can get a much better and more thorough understanding of what it is we're getting into here. And we're going to do our best to give you the the high level understanding of all this, especially with regard to the Anunnaki and Enlil and Enki. Uh, mm -hmm. But we get into much greater detail in our first two shows. So it sounds to me, Priscilla, like the God that we really should be concerned about. It sounds like we're leaning into perhaps it should be Yahweh. People need to take a real hard look at the God known as Yahweh or Allah or Jehovah. My book lays it all out for anybody who does, who does not want to do the work for themselves. The name of the book is Hallowed Be Thy Name, Lucifer Origins and Revelation, and you can get that on Amazon.com. It's over 700 pages. It's very dense material, but the subject is inherently dense to begin with. So if you're into this sort of thing, be prepared to spend some time on it. Well, I think that a lot of people need to get more into it because as we kick this show off, we said that people are using these terms out of context. They're just accepting the uh, the definition that was given to them by authorities and by establishment. And I'm going to say that the predominant authority and establishment with regard to Luciferianism, satanic demons, is the Roman Church. All right. Um, Right. So that's that's going to be my position. I don't think I'm wrong on it for the folks that are in the research, the alternative research community and in the conspiracy research movement. They really need to pick up a copy of your book. I've just started reading it. I, I bought it and there's a lot there. And, you know, I take my time going through it. But you did a, a masterful piece of work, Priscilla, I have to tell you. Thank it's you. Well documented. So I think that many folks who are doing the research and are continuing to use terms that were handed to them. And they're just assuming that these terms mean what they really mean. And we're saying that, no, that's not the case. They should dig into your book and they should read it and they should start to understand the dynamics that are at play here and get a better grasp on when they call something Luciferian or when they call something satanic or demonic. I think by reading your book and maybe listening to our shows, some folks might change their tune. Definitely. And Using the terms Luciferian and, and Satanic in a colloquial way is, is basically giving in to the propaganda spewed from the pulpit of primarily Roman Catholic churches. And I, was, I grew up Roman Catholic, so I know all about that. And another uh, piece of propaganda which ties in with the Eden myth and the so-called deceiving of the Eve, uh, something that priests did. <clears throat> excuse me, back at the time when Christianity was gaining momentum, was that they <laughs> they took the word for apple in Latin, which is malum, and did a wordplay on another Latin word, malice, which means bad or evil intent. So the two became synonymous because of that. While we're on that, it's not an apple to begin with. All of the medieval paintings, all the Renaissance paintings, 
show an apple. But if you read the extra biblical descriptions, it describes it as a bunch of grapes on a vine. Yeah. But yeah, the that's effects, why I had said I had said fruit. I, I intentionally did not say yeah, apple. Fruit, yeah, fruit. Fruit is just a generic term applied to this substance, whatever it was. But then, if you read the effects of this so-called grapes on a vine, uh, is they're hallucinogenic effects in all accounts. So it couldn't literally be grapes. It couldn't be an apple. I believe it, it was magic mushrooms, and that is inherent. This um, one of seven cults, primitive cults from which all religions supposedly sprung, one of them was the cult of the mushroom, and that is preserved in the Eden myth. And the other cults include the cult of uh, the mountain, which is the same as the cult of fire, the volcano, the cult of Venus, the stellar, lunar, and solar cults as well. From these, apparently... According to anthropology, religion sprung from this idea. of, And the, the one thing that ties it all together and that deifies everything, I believe, was the magic mushrooms. You take some mushrooms, you lay on your back and stare into the starry sky, things are going to happen. You're going to see hallucinations. And I believe that's how it came to be if our current paradigm is true. Yeah, I think that's a... Uh... A very logical and very valid view of what it could be. Many of the ancient texts, the Bible included, you know, they they refer to uh, prophets having visions and so on. It's always been my theory that these visions were uh, these visions were brought about via substances like magic mushrooms, exactly, or ayahuasca and... types of mm -hmm. plants. Yeah, yeah, and even the Moses and the burning bush is a result of, I believe, him taking mushrooms and seeing this bush burn. Priscilla, maybe we could just, just roll back a little bit to Yahweh, and because some folks are really going to have a hard time with this, because the indoctrination and the inculcation is so deep, and it's been going on for thousands of years. But the Old Testament, which is, there's 39 books in the Old Testament, and 27 books in the New Testament. So we'll just focus on the the Old Testament, which is the 39 books, Yahweh is openly known as a vengeful and wrathful God. Yes. Yet he's supposed to be the God, the all-loving God. That's so a contradiction. Have, it's a contradiction. We have a, we have a dichotomy. We have his vengeful, wrathful God, and then we're told that he's an all-loving God. So I think it's incumbent upon folks who are listening and still struggling a little bit about who Lucifer really was or who Satan really represents or what Satan really represents, to go back and, and to read the Old Testament and, and take a look at all of the stories and events that take place where Yahweh slash Jehovah is commanding that people be smited. We're talking about men, women, children, animals and taking land. I think that's a very important aspect of this because I know when I was doing my studies, Priscilla, you know, I was taken back by a lot of it. I, I just couldn't believe that what I was taught as a kid going uh, to catechism, you know, as a Roman Catholic, you go to catechism. Yeah. This stuff was never brought up. No, know? and they're not going to bring it up because it's it, it raises a lot of questions, even yeah. for children. Let's ask, we have to ask, how many people were killed by Yahweh in the Bible? How many people were killed by Satan in the Bible? And again, it wasn't the Satan. It was Yahweh's angels. So really, he's the one doing all the slaughtering. Yeah. You know, and then and then you, we look at history, human history. How many people have been killed in Yahweh's name, in Allah's name? How many people have been killed in Lucifer's name or Satan's name? You know, the, the difference is, excuse the pun, night and day. Yeah, that's the thing, is that uh, we don't have really any evidence that Lucifer or, or Satan, I mean, there's no history. There's no books or lists of, uh, of anything out there that aggregates all the evil or documents all the evil that they have been involved in. I mean, all the evil that they are 
they have been claimed to be involved in has come in, like you said, via the pulpits, via outside inputs coming into people and saying, these are the entities, these are the beings, this is the ideology, if you will, the belief system that is involved in evil. But they have nothing to back it up with. And you correct me if I'm wrong. No, that is correct. And what that ultimately comes down to is this uh, innate, seemingly innate human desire to want to place all of life's iniquities and, and, and unfortunate uh, troubles on to somebody else. It's this need to hate something other than yourself, something that's unfamiliar, something that is uh, perhaps alien to what you know and what you experience. And today we, we still see that happening. Um, any form of discrimination is, is considered, um, you know, it's, it's somebody else. It's not me. It's, it's this other group. Evil comes from anywhere but myself. But if we look, for example, in the U.S., all of the policies and all of the laws that get passed that enforce discrimination on every level are, you know, passed by people who profess to be deeply Christian. So what does that tell us? It tells us that Christians and Christianity has this warped morality to it. Uh, and there's this contradiction with their God. He's jealous. He's vindictive. He's murderous. And yet he's supposed to be all loving, all caring, all knowing. Well, if you're all, if you're omniscient, if you're omnipotent, I cannot fathom that that would be an evil force. Because if you understand everything, with understanding comes acceptance and tolerance and, and love, ultimately. But if you don't understand others, if you refuse to understand others, uh, that germinates strife. It germinates um, ill will and ultimately evil. And why would an all-loving God put their creation through the things that humanity has been put through all through history up to the current day. And that's something that's always bogged my mind, to be honest with you. And right. that's why I had to step out of religion many, many years ago, Priscilla, is because I, I just could not see how this was making any sense. But, uh, you know, I think that, like I said before, I think this is something that people who are in the research community or in the conspiracy movement from a research perspective who continue to use the words Luciferian or use the words satanic or demonic, as I said before, they need to, I think, take a step back and they really need to understand what Lucifer means, what Satan means, what demons mean, exactly what you took us through earlier in this discussion, and to start getting their heads wrapped around the, the source of all this. And the source of all this, like I mentioned before, it rolls up through the Roman Church. and all of this comes in under, based upon my research, the Jesuits out of the Vatican. And the Jesuits are not, I mean, they're not this fun-loving group of guys. They have an agenda. It's a very dark agenda. If anybody's ever looked into the Jesuits or taken a look at their oaths and so on. I did a show uh, on this with uh, Jamie Lee. We got into it to a great extent about the Jesuits, but and I don't want to go on a, off on a tangent on you, but uh, the point I'm trying to make is that the people who are telling us that these other entities or beings or these deities or these gods are evil, that the people who are telling us that they're evil, they're engaged. The people giving us that information, they're engaged in a lot of evil. They're engaged in a lot of dark stuff. And it is almost like this mass cognitive dissonance. And I know why it's there. It's because a lot of people, they just don't have the knowledge or the understanding, as an example, we're talking about Yahweh and, and, you know, everything that the wrathful, vengeful God in the Old Testament and some of his, uh, his edicts and, and commands that he was giving to his, uh, to his minions. It's not good stuff. And I, and I think people really need to understand how all of this is, it's being presented and how you're being told the opposite of what you would know if you actually did your homework and read the source material. As an example, if you did the research and you read through the Old Testament and studied it, you would understand that we have a disconnect between 
the God that's represented in the Old Testament and the, the how the church is depicting or how Christianity, and I want to say more of the Roman Catholic Church because there's a lot of Christian sects that don't focus on Yahweh. Uh, they, they focus on Jesus. But you can see that we have this dichotomy. We, we have this polarized opposites taking place with regard to who this God is and what he represents. I know that was long-winded. I hope it made sense. You know, the... <sighs> The disconnect between people not researching, not really giving the words in these books a hard look and, and really using their critical thinking skills and taking in and listening to what priests and prelates say from their pulpits. You know, if you take that at face value, it's it might make sense on the surface. If you did no research whatsoever throughout your life. It makes a lot of sense. And I bought into that, too, when I was a kid growing up. But then, you know, at some point I said, hold on a second. Some of this doesn't make sense. And that set me on a path to look into it more. And, you know, ultimately my book came out of it. But the ignorance people have of ancient knowledge concerning these issues is the sole reason that the church continues to uh can continue to propagate this illusion of their god being this all-loving figure when the evidence points to the exact contrary yeah it's it's all about ignorance versus knowledge and going back to the eden story as a metaphor the serpent satan he gave us knowledge you know quote unquote and uh we have to use that we use it in every aspect of our lives or we should at least, um, except when it comes to this subject, except when it comes to religion. Don't look into it. Don't believe any of the facts. Just, you know, listen to what the preacher says and then go about your day. Yeah, I'm, I, I could tell you that over the years, I, I caught a lot of flack for calling out certain things that were contained in the Bible, mostly the Old Testament, but there's also lots of stuff you can you can pick apart in the New Testament. So it's it's very important again, folks. You know, listening to the show that that you dig into this, and it's going to take a lot of work. And one of the things you can do, maybe to kind of cut to the chase, is buy Priscilla's book because she's done a lot of the work for you. In Hallowed Be Thy Name. Now, Priscilla, I don't know. I don't want to uh, to derail you here. So, is this a good point in which to maybe maybe just touch on again? Uh, going back to the Anunnaki, Enlil, and Enki, so that maybe folks yeah. who are listening to us for the first time on this topic can understand why it is that when we say Yahweh was Enlil, and that's not a good thing, and when we say that Lucifer was Enki, and Enki was far more benevolent than his brother Enlil, much more understanding of humanity and helpful to humanity is what I should say with regard to Enki. So can you take us through that a little bit? And um, Sure. So, so folks can get a baseline? Sure. Um, you have to go back to the Sumerians and what they wrote and what they believed. And what they wrote was a, um, a strife, ultimate strife, between two brothers, Enki and Enlil, who were um, – not pure blood brothers. Their father, Anu, which comes from An, which is a word that means heaven, he and this goddess Inanna, which later became Ishtar and all the rest, they had a son, Enlil, and Anu had a son with a concubine, and that son was Enki. Now, the Akkadians recognized Enlil as Elil, and Enki as Ea, but Enki to the Sumerians was the god of the earth, the god of the soil, the underworld god. And Ea was the god of the seas, of the oceans, the subaqueous deity. Uh, so there's this split in uh, personality. You have the underworld god and the undersea god. And that comes through in all the subsequent mythologies up until the Romans. And in um, Babylon, we have the same uh, names, but in Canaan, Enki became Mot, Lord of the Underworld, and Ea, which is also Enki, became Yam, God of the Sea. And in Greece, we have the same thing. Hades is the Underlord, and uh, Poseidon is the Underwater Lord. 
So, but these are two aspects of the same deity, going back to the Sumerians, and that's how we know. Now, Enlil is the god of the wind. En means lord. Lil was wind. And that carries over into other mythologies. For example, in Canaan, he was Baal. And Baal was the rider of the wind. So we see the connection there etymologically and symbolically with the wind. And, of course, he's a storm god. And in Greece, he was Zeus. And the Romans believed he was Jupiter. And that became Yahweh, the Ayu Pater, the father Ayo. And that became Yahweh, uh, which derived from the Semitic Yah. Uh, the tribal god Yah, which was a warlike deity. He was very warlike. And um, the being known as Satan came from Enki through all these connections with water and even the dragon symbol, uh, which we can get into more later. But the dragon symbol ultimately derived from the water too. Uh, and in Revelation, Satan is called the red dragon. And in the Babylonian epic of creation, the Anuma Elish, the undersea dragon, was Tiamat, which was a goddess, the mother of the gods, which gave birth to what was known as chaos monsters, which was her offspring, which uh, was the subaqueous um, army that she controlled. But Satan ultimately goes back to the goddess, ultimately goes back to the water deity, and as an underworld deity, goes back to figures like Hades, Mott, and Enki. So we have a lot of these connections that we can draw, and I do it in the book. It's a lot more complex than this, but I don't want to bog the listeners down with all the boring terminology. If you want that, you can get a copy of the book and get into it very intricately. It is important that folks make these these ties and these connections. I know a lot of people are into the Sumerians and the Anunnaki, but they have no clue that Enlil was Yahweh and Enki right. was Satan. They have no idea. They just they just focus on Enlil and Enki, and and that's it. So basically, it's very compartmentalized, and it goes no further than that. And it's very important for folks to understand that you had gone through all the gods through the different civilizations that represent what we know as Yahweh today, Jupiter, right? Right. Um, these are not just a bunch of gods that are just thrown out there. They're all connected in one way or another. And I know it could be very, very onerous to make these connections, especially when you're just getting started with this stuff and trying to understand who is, is what. I remember when I was first getting into this, uh, Priscilla, and trying to understand, well, this Babylonian god, how does that god connect to a Roman god or a Greek god. And I tell you, it's, it's not easy. It's, it's really not easy. It's really not. And it's not meant to be easy. It was, it was concealed and encoded for good reason, you know, and in a time when education was virtually non-existent, that pretty much solidified the uh, propaganda which uh, the priests uh, put forth throughout the ages. The concept that Enki, uh, who became Satan, ultimately, is the benevolent deity, and Enlil, who ultimately became Yahweh, is the malevolent deity, uh, that comes from the narratives themselves. And the old epics, the Epic of Gilgamesh, the Enuma Elish, um, the Baal cycle, and the Canaanite mythologies, all these things are extant in the Genesis story in the Bible. And I focus on Genesis chapters 2 through 11 because those events are the most crucial to understand uh, and because it is the foundation on which the rest of the Bible, the Old, the New Testament, and the Quran rest. If you read the Quran, the mythology in that comes from the Old Testament. It's all shared because it's all the God of Abraham, hence the term Abrahamic religion. Just to reinforce the audience, Enlil was not kind toward humans. In fact, in Enlil's domain, humans were there and created for the purposes of being a slave race, right? 
Right. They took the place of the Agigi. They were suffering and toiling in the mines, which was underwater, not in Southeast Africa. Uh, Zachariah Sitchin was wrong in his interpretations, and it it was uh, his Nibiru hypothesis, uh, as far as my research points out, it was a complete fabrication. Uh, which gets into the ufology subject of these terms satanic and luciferian. A lot of people like to apply these to alien races that allegedly exist, like the greys and the reptilians and the Nordics. And it's, you know, commonly believed that the reptilians are demonic and the Nordics are angelic. But that's a very childish way of looking at it because it relies on people's biased perceptions of what a demon is supposed to look like and what an angel is supposed to look like. But like I said at the start of the show, there's really no difference between them because they're basically demoted deities from other pantheons before it. One other point I wanted to make with regard to Enlil and uh, my comment about Enlil having humans created for the purposes of being a slave race. Folks, if you take a look at what's going on today, humans are still a slave race. You're, you're still indebted to an establishment or an authority. And of course, that establishment and the authority that we see, that's not what exists behind the curtain. So I'm going to oversimplify this, but what's behind the curtain is Enlil. And in front of the curtain, he has his minions ensuring that this structure, this slave structure that we're involved in, continues to stay in place. And I think the last time we spoke, Priscilla, you had mentioned that Enki was giving technology to humans in order to make their lives easier, right. to make things better. And initially, I guess Enlil agreed that, okay, you can do that, but that was very short-lived. And I guess... I'm seeing that today, too. So let, let me just play this through, and you tell me whether you agree or not, or if you have a different perspective. But today, we have a lot of technology. And the technology that we have today can be used for very good reasons. As an example, you and I right now are communicating and doing this interview via Skype. But an overlord that knows you have this technology and that we're getting benefit from it can also use it for nefarious means. In other words, right now, they could very well be monitoring or tapping into or storing this conversation between Mike Williams and Priscilla. That's not a good thing. It's the surveillance state, the big brother stuff, right? So what I'm saying is, is that it, when we had the discussion in the last show and you explained the dynamics between Enlil's philosophy and humans and Enki's philosophy and humans, Enki being benevolent, Enlil being malevolent, that I'm still seeing that playing out today. So if it's still playing out today, what does that mean? It means that Enlil is alive and well. Let me just phrase it this way. Maybe not physically, but his legacy of how he wanted to treat humanity lives on. I guess that's what I wanted to say. Yeah, and that, that is correct. Um, he could be alive physically, but that's that gets into another concept, which we can get into later. But our human hierarchy structure is based on what we see in mythology. And this crossover between the mythic times and the documented historical times, which started with Sumer and uh, even further back, like Katalhuyuk and, and Gobekli Tepe and sites like this in, in Anatolia, this tie-in uh, involves heavily the Tower of Babel story. Because the first three kings appointed were, uh, their systems of government were hagiocracies. Uh, they were priest kings, um, intermediaries between humans and the deities themselves. And at this time, the, the gods lived in, or from time to time appeared in the adetums of, of their temples, of the ziggurats that were constructed. And the adetum is the, the top uppermost uh, room of the ziggurat pyramid. But before this time, they were walking as a race among people. And there were two factions, the Cainites and the Sethites. 
from the line of Cain and the line of Seth. And because Cain was the son of Satan and Seth was the son of Adam. So Yahweh Enlil ruled the line of Adam and Satan, Lucifer, ruled his own line, his own bloodline. And these two uh, factions were in very different living conditions. Lucifer uh, provided technology. His uh, so-called fallen angels helped with that, taught them the arts of civilization and technology, and implemented that. They lived in a life of luxury. They lived in peace and acceptance. And Yahweh's uh, rule was very strict, far more than his brother. And they didn't have all the luxuries that the Canaanites had. And, you know, we see this today with the haves and the have-nots. You know, the have-nots, uh, our God, should be Lucifer. He is the God of the outcast, of the downtrodden, of the uh, marginalized. Yahweh, uh, his whole structure uh, has been reproduced in our human culture throughout the ages with kingship and uh, queenship. And it still continues today, even in the United States. We have a form of rule. And people who we don't know, who we largely don't have contact with anymore, are making the laws for us, and, and we just have to obey or suffer consequences, which is the exact mentality Yahweh had, if you read your mythology. Now, Enlil and Enki, Yahweh and Satan, they were not on an even playing field. If I recall our last conversation, if we looked at it like a, a pyramid structure, a structure of, of a pyramid of power, that there was a hierarchy, and that, in that within that hierarchy, Enlil was... Uh, a notch or two above Enki, is that right? Enlil was the prized son. He was the son that uh, Anu liked more than Enki, and that's purely for blood reasons. Like I said, Enki was born of a concubine, and therefore his status was lower than Enlil in their father's eyes. Yeah, he was uh, something of a bastard child. Just so we can clear this up a little bit, Priscilla, then is Yahweh... The creator? Now, Yahweh, I distinguish from the Demiurge, from uh, the from the Omni God, as it were. Uh, there is Yahweh Allah, Jehovah, who is this anthropomorphic figure that we see in the narratives, who goes on killing sprees, who says he's loving and then turns around and you know does harmful things to others. That is very different from the uh, what I describe as the god of the universe, the known universe, or depending on your scientific perspective, the multiverse. I view this deity, this um, concept, as a neutral energy from which everything springs. You know, there's some people trying to put this in a scientific context. It's whatever came before the Big Bang. It's the it's the neutral energy, the all that is, the monad, the I am, uh, the. Uh, does this make sense? Is Yahweh a demiurge? No, demiurge means world creator, and what creates worlds is nature, natural forces. The Gnostics refer to Yahweh, if I'm not mistaken, as the demiurge. That's why I'm confused. <clears throat> right, but the demiurge was considered evil by the Gnostics. He was known as Ialdabaoth, or Yaldabaoth, depending on your spelling, and it varies throughout the text. Is that um, not Yahweh? That is Yahweh, yeah. And Samael is an early name for Satan uh, when he was an angel, or Sataniel is another uh, extra-biblical term for Satan. And he was the one that planted the vine in the Garden of Eden that later became the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Okay, so I'm, I'm still, I'm, I'm probably thick as a brick on this thing. So if the Gnostics are saying that Yahweh was or is the Demiurge, mm -hmm. am I missing something? The Gnostics uh, said that all the angels, including Yahweh, all the deities, came from uh, what's called as uh, Pistis Sophia, faith wisdom, uh, which is the Shekinah. And the Shekinah 
is this energy, this this um, this energy from which all these deities came from. It's a creative force. It's this is the demiurge, the true demiurge, and I, I distinguish between. Uh, the Yahweh that we see in the Bible and the true God, which is this neutral energy of from which all that is, was, ever will be, comes from. So is Sophia then the Demiurge? Yeah. Yeah, Sophia is the Demiurge. It's just a name. It's just a name. It seems to me when I read John Lash's book, mm. Not in His Name, that he did not refer to Sophia as the Demiurge, that it was it was clearly Yahweh was the Demiurge. Uh, and I'm not saying John is right. I'm just saying that that's what I got out of his book when I read his book, not in his image. Um, yeah. But you're saying that, no, Sophia is the true Demiurge, and Sophia actually created Yahweh? Exactly. That's what the Gnostic texts uh, describe. And John's book focuses a lot on ecology and things other than what we're talking about. But yeah, he comes from a purely Gnostic point of view, and if you don't consider uh, other religions and other mythologies, then on that level, sure. We can uh, okay, with I, that. I, I got it now. Okay, so what you're mm -hmm. saying is your your view of it is taking in a, a broader perspective of other texts, other religions, and so on, whereas John is coming at it from a purely Gnostic viewpoint. Right. Right. And other uh, authors like Zechariah Sitchin came at it from a purely Sumerian point of view. And um, that's fine if that's what you want to do, but you have to realize that it's all connected and all needs to be considered. Okay, so you took multiple inputs yeah, and you said, okay, so I'm getting all these inputs coming in, all these variables of who's who. So now I have to try to figure out, sift through it, and understand who is where in the pecking order. Right, exactly. Okay, I got it, I got it, okay. And if you do that, you, you see very clearly that the what I call the Pantheon Major, the Council of Twelve, uh, is carried over from culture to culture in very similar ways. Uh, that You can draw parallels between the deities, and it gets... Uh, it gets confusing the further on you go, and by the time you get to the Greeks, it bears very little resemblance to what the Sumerians said. And if you go to the Nordics, uh, Norse mythology is almost completely severed from its original source. Uh, if you just take Norse mythology on its own, uh, I don't see how anybody could get to the original meaning of any of it, to be honest. But if you take it for what it is on its own, it can be a lot of fun. Yeah. You know. I don't know how you did all this, to be honest. With you. <laughs> In the last show, we spoke and you said it was 10 mm. years worth of research and then you wrote the book. Yeah. And, you know, you're you're young. You're a lot younger than I am. And so you got started, what, 24 years old, you said? Uh, I was 20 when I started reading about the subject. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> wow. Okay. <laughs> well. It was just you. a really nagging Thing at the back of my head growing up you know I went through a lot of depression as a teenager but when I entered into my 20s I still had this nagging uh, need to know who is God who is Satan is there a hell is there a heaven what are these things and you know where does the Bible come from where do these concepts come from and that led me down this path no and you're writing a second book right or yeah is that underway it is uh, right now I've I have uh, a good amount written, but I, I still need to write a good amount of it and uh, do some more research. But the second book is going to focus on the underworld and hopefully uh, the mythological events that took place before the events uh, that I detail in my book, Hallowed Be Thy Name. So I'm trying to go even further back in mythic time. How do you do that, Priscilla? In other words, how do you know what source documents to look at? How does that work? I'm sure there's a lot of books that you're reading, but I'm sure it's a yeah. lot more than just books. How, how do you go about that? Because it seems to be unbelievably daunting. And, you know, you have to know, I guess, before you get started, or maybe even, you know, shortly after you get started reading something or digging into something, you have to make a, a decision quickly that I'm on the right path or I'm on the wrong path. In other words, the, the material I'm looking at may not be 
uh, material I should be looking at because it's loaded up with disinformation or it's whatever. It's it's not valid for some reason that you determined. So how do you do that? How do you decide what it is that you're going to pursue? And I'm talking about material wise and, and what it is that you're not going to uh, take a look at. It's just a lot of hard research. That's the short answer. <laughs> um, I am limited to the English language. I'm not a linguist, but what I do is I, for example, the Old Testament. How did I know which translation to use? Because there's a million different translations. Right. And the further you get from the original text, the more meaning is lost. Everything has changed. These new English translations that are coming out still, it's so far from the original text. It's a mess. Yeah. You have to you have to stop with that nonsense. This there's modern language translations now. <laughs> That's just ludicrous to me. It it strips the meaning of so much. So what I do is I look into the history of these texts who originally compiled them. And um, the first chapter in my book, Hallowed Be Thy Name, gets into who wrote the Bible, how it came to be, the translations that were made, and uh, why we have the translation we have today. Um, that's how it starts. And then I get into the mythology of everything. Because you need to understand that there's a big difference between modern translation and ancient translation because the ancient people wrote it you have to take it in that context you have to understand these words from that era um and that's what i've laid out that's what you have to do you have to research the history of a text and and try to get to the most uh, uh the most legitimate original source you can and like i said i don't know I don't read ancient languages. It's, you know, being a linguist is not something I'm particularly interested in. So like with the Old Testament, the original was called the Septuagint, which was the Greek that got put in the Library of Alexandria, which is why the translation was made to begin with. Um, and then there's the revised standard version, which came about around the turn of the 19th century. And that's supposed to be uh, more uh, true to the original Hebrew than the Septuagint because the Septuagint is from the Greek. So you have to take it uh, from these different languages too. And the New Testament of King James from that was published in 1611 uh, was from the Latin Vulgate. And that went through a lot of translations before it became what it is. So what I did was I said, I will use the Revised Standard Version because it claims to be the the truest translation from the original Hebrew, which is what you'll want. But then on the same token, I wanted to use the texts that were approved by the Church of England, by the Roman Catholic Church. Um, so I incorporated all three translations in my work, and I consider all of them. And you have to cross foot and, and cross check, right? So as you read yes. and you do your research, you, you just don't sit there and say, well, I'm going to run with this particular source. You then have to look at other sources. Right. If I, if I find a particular verse that is striking to me in some way, I have to go through each uh, translation and see what they say because they could say different things and then um, come to a conclusion based on that. Okay. Mm. And is it true? Because this is what I learned when I was doing my research into uh, uh, the Roman Church and Christianity, that the Bible itself has, well, there's two things. One, there's no original source documents. What I mean is like the original Gospel of Luke. There is no original. What we have later generations or iterations of that particular Gospel. Same thing with Mark and so mm -hmm. on. And that we do not know any of the authors right. of the Bible, of any right. of the books in the Bible. There's 66, well, right? 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New. Yeah. Put them together, you have 66, and we don't know, we really don't know unequivocally who those authors are. Well, actually, the uh, canonic Gospels w uh, were started by Marcion, uh, I think it was the 2nd century BC. He was the one that started because he was a Gnostic. And uh, there are Gnostic Gospels 
attributed to the other apostles of the alleged Jesus. That was taken to um, form what became the New Testament. Taking the... Um, but the original Gospel of Luke. Yeah. On the original piece of... I'll say paper, but it might not have been paper. Paper, parchment, <laughs> yeah. whatever. Parchment. That is not known to exist. It may, yeah, exist. It may be sitting in some vault somewhere under the Vatican. Well, but from a, from a research or scholar perspective, <laughs> as far as any research or scholar knows, the original document does not exist. Unfortunately, Marcion's original work has been lost. There you and go, yep. That makes me question whether or not it is in the Vatican Library. We don't know because nobody's allowed in except, exactly. except those at the top. So for researchers like yourself, you have to rely on the best possible earliest generations of these documents. Right. Knowing, knowing in the back of your mind that that document could very well have been in some way altered. Exactly. But you also have to consider what people believe. And what people believe does not, in most cases, does not correspond with what the facts say. However, I used, again, for example, the Septuagint and the King James original Bible because they were approved by the church, and that's what people believe. So yeah. I wanted to uh, let people read for themselves the original sources. So everything that I cite, I really spell it out. Everything is typed out. I didn't uh, alter the uh, uh, mid-English uh, language, the medieval English language in the New Testament. I didn't alter that so that people understand that I'm not trying to fabricate anything. I'm just taking what's there and pointing it out. Yeah. Do you have a mm -hmm. social life? <laughs> <laughs> Not much of one. <laughs> <laughs> because this stuff is so dense. You know, I remember when yeah. I was doing my research and I was just looking at the Christian aspect of it, the Roman church. You know, I, I had <laughs> books like piled up to here, you know, and it's, the material is so dense. It's not something that you just breeze through, you know, it's not like, it's not easy reading type of stuff, you know. And um, so, and, and you're far more into it than, than I was. And you've been at it a lot longer than I was. And and like I said, I was looking at one aspect. I was just looking at it from the Christian perspective. And you're, you're taking in everything else. So it's, it's a lot of I, – I can vouch for it just based upon my own experiences that what you're putting in is a lot of work and it's extremely time-consuming. Yeah, it is. I don't have a big social life, but I have my wife and I'm happy with her. <laughs> well, there you go. That's all it counts. Yeah. <laughs> good. Yeah. Very good. So where did you want to go next, Priscilla? Is there anything else that you wanted to do? Yeah, let's get back to my our original point. These terms, satanic, luciferian, demonic. Now that we understand these terms are not negative, they they do not give off a sense of evil, knowing what these terms really mean and who these deities are. Um, when you look at the conspiracy research, for example, with the Pizzagate and the, the child prostitution rings that allegedly exist, yeah, they... They exist throughout the world, not just with the Illuminati, but they could be at the um, the ultimate source of it being promulgated. Uh, does that mean that it's satanic or Luciferian just because it's evil? No, because the, that's not what these terms mean. I'm not going to turn around and say that I'm going to say that these things are Christian or are Jewish or are uh, you know Islamic. Because I don't know that to be true either. Um, I'm not involved with that sort of thing, so how would I know? But if you want to determine which religion these people are engaged in, look at the rituals that they do, the rituals themselves. I personally don't concern myself with ritual, rite, and ceremony and all that because I don't feel that it's needed in my life personally. But I understand that a lot of people need that in their life. And there's nothing inherently wrong with it. But if you're going to say the people who do evil things are Luciferian or, or, or Satanists, um, you have to back that up. You have to say, well, here's the rituals that they do. Uh, and this is correspondent with this religion and this religious organization. And this is what they do. Uh, I have not seen anybody do that. 
You know, I've not okay, I've yeah. not seen any uh, real proof of that. I listen to the uh, conspiracy people talk about these subjects uh, for hours and hours. You know, there's no shortage of interviews coming out by people in the alternative research field, and it's good work that's being done. But a lot is from a Christian perspective, and that's very biased. Let me just see if I can make sure I understand what you're saying. So if somebody says, oh, that's Luciferian or that's satanic, I guess the question would be then, well, how do you know that that's Luciferian? How do you know that child trafficking, child abuse, pedophilia, dark rituals have to do with Lucifer or have to do with Satan? How do you know that? And the answer will be, what do you mean, how do I know that? Everybody knows that. That's just, that's common knowledge. But that's a cop out. Mm -hmm. Right. That's somebody who's saying, I really don't know. I, I'm applying a definition which was given to me and I'm applying it to that type of activity. So when you were saying, well, if you go to a Luciferian church or a satanic church, are these the rituals that they are engaged in? Now, some people are going to say, because I know some people right now are losing their minds with us. Some people are going to say, we have satanic groups all over the place. And they have upside down pentagrams and they're, you know, and they're doing rituals and they've got altars and they've got naked bodies on the altars and everything is about blood. And so you guys, you're out in left field somewhere because you want to know what these guys are engaged in. Well, it's not too hard to find it. But the point, I guess, is, is that because somebody claims that this is who they are, I'm a Satanist as an example, right? Let's just say they say, I'm a Satanist. And they're doing these things. How do we know that they're not doing these things based upon their own interpretation of what they believe Satanism is about? Right. We have many, many different sects within Christianity. And there are sects within Christianity that do not agree with each other at all. At all. But they still call themselves Christians. So I, I guess, I hope I'm making sense here, but a lot of these people that are calling themselves Satanists and they dress up and they're looking very satanic with their garb and their robes and upside down crosses and like I said, the altars and the pentagrams. But who decided that a Satanist dresses up in a black robe? Right. Who defined all that? I've watched a couple of interviews from people who were Satanists. And I, look, I'm not espousing Satanism, okay? I'm just trying to get a logical point across, see if I can get people to kind of think of it from a different perspective so that we can delineate between stuff that's given to us, terms to use incorrectly versus terms we should be using in a more appropriate fashion. Satanists will say, and even uh, I think in Anton LaVey's uh, Satanic Bible, the people who are practicing true Satanism, and I won't call that Luciferianism because I'm sure there's some delineation, they don't dress up like that. They don't engage like that. They don't call attention to themselves in that fashion. So I, I guess what he was saying is is that what we have is this kind of amateurish offshoot of what true Satanism is all about. And that's the stuff that gets put out into the public arena. And that's what the public sees. And that's what the public buys into. And that's what they believe Satanism is, is, is all about. It's basically this sideshow circus with people walking around with robes and upside yeah. down pentagons. Um, yeah, the researchers who uh, call the... Illuminati cabal Satanist or Luciferian is coming again from a Christian perspective. And how do they, you know, these things that these people do are evil, they're negative, they're not good for the rest of us, and, and et cetera, et cetera. So therefore, it must be Satanic, it must be Luciferian. And how do I know that? Because the Bible tells me, because the preacher tells me when I go to church. Well, oh, <laughs> you're not doing any research, are you? Yeah. You're just taking somebody's word for it. Don't take anybody's word for it. You got to look into it yourself. You know, you got to make yeah. your own conclusions there. Yeah, I got long winded, but that's exactly right. That's the point is that you're you're expressing what you believe it is based upon not doing any research, not understanding it. And that you have to understand that uh, people who are participating in kind of the sideshow circus element of this thing, you know, that could also be, to be honest with you, part of a scheme or an agenda in order to make people believe and get their heads wrapped around that that is indeed what it's about. So in other words, there's like, a, how would you say, controlled opposition, I guess, in a, in a way, you know? Yeah. And, and you know, I, I think it was Hitler that said, if you say something 
for enough. If you say something long enough. To make the lie big enough, yeah. And make it big enough, people will believe it. That's basically what has happened with these terms. I want to express to folks that we're not espousing anything here. We're not saying that Luciferianism or Satanism is good or uh, another religion is good or bad. We're not, we're not trying to say that. What we're trying to do is we're trying to cut through this very, very deep, dense smoke that is out there. And I, I tell you, Priscilla, you got my thoughts going based upon our first two conversations because I was down that path. I mean, I would say, no, it's, this is Luciferian. This is satanic. This is demonic. I mean, I was guilty of it. And then as you and I talked about this and as you took me through the whole story of the Anunnaki and Enlil and Enki and how that became Yahweh and Satan and so on, I had to take a step back and I had to say to myself, okay, so is this another one of those massive dupes that has been put upon most of humanity where we are misusing terms or misapplying belief systems? I guess that part of the problem is is that I guess some people out there not even don't even believe that the Anunnaki existed. That is something that's called Eumerism, the historicity of mythology, attributed to a man called Euhemeros in the fourth century BC in the court of um, King Misander, and he is the first to be attributed to his applying a historical perspective to mythology and the gods as flesh and blood beings that once existed. Now, he in particular, um, if you read the very, very few sources that exist of his work, which are scattered in other people's work, um, you'll, you'll see that he apparently believed that the gods were once humans uh, whose exploits were later apotheosized into uh, deities. But I don't agree with that because if you look at the descriptions of the gods, they are not human, not not in the least. Uh, people look to the Bible and say, well, it says in Genesis that we were created in God's image and therefore God must be human in appearance. Uh, that's not true because I, the Bible does say that. But again, we have to go back to the earlier sources and the earlier Babylonian, Sumerian sources, uh, from what little descriptions that exist, describe these beings as um, subaqueous uh, reptilians. They, they're uh, amphibious beings, part fish, part man, part reptile. So they're definitely not human. And, and again, when Noah was uh, born, his description was not human. And even his father uh, said he is not like us. He is one of he, he looks like one of the angels. Well, that tells us he was not human either. We have to do away with this notion that uh, mythology can be explained in scientific terms because uh, these are kind of different subjects. Science is used as a tool to explain things in mythology, like te technology, for example. Um, the word cloud is a code word that's used as an aerial vehicle. Um, like I said before, Baal was a cloud writer. Yahweh descended in pillars of cloud, etc., etc. Um, today, we use the internet, which is quote-unquote everywhere and nowhere, and store information on clouds. Is it the clouds in the sky? No, of course not. You know, these are code words used for something else. And this is how we have to approach mythology. Yeah, and you know, when you were talking about what the gods, uh, what they may have looked like or how they may have appeared, I want to ask the audience now, if somebody said to you to draw a picture of Jesus, most people would sit down and they would draw this young guy with a beard and long sure. hair, right? The truth of the matter is, in the Bible, there was absolutely no description, physical description whatsoever of Jesus. Right. So the question you have to ask yourself is, how did we get a physical description and pictorial illustrations of Jesus if there's no description in the Bible of what Jesus looked like. We have no idea how tall he was. We have no idea how much he weighed. We know we have no idea what kind of hairdo he had, whether he had a beard or not, his color eyes. But even though we have none of that, somewhere along the line, a depiction of Jesus was brought forth. Yeah, and that came about from 
descriptions that we know of uh, men who lived during those times, how they dressed, what they looked like, how they kept their hair, right. um, et cetera. But at the same time, we also have to look at other evidence that people don't bring up, which is the fact that um, the Gospels were written and compiled, among other New Testament uh, books, by the Flavian dynasty. The Roman aristocracy put this out there. And this is something that a lot of people are going to have a hard time getting their heads around. Jesus, as a historical figure, was brought about by an effort commissioned by the Flavian dynasty uh, with, with Josephus and other uh, writers under him to concoct this uh, ministry, this story, which was actually based on uh, Titus's campaign through Jerusalem at that time. And uh, Joseph Atwell has a really good book that came out a few years back called Caesar's Messiah that exposes a part of this. He didn't get through all of the gospel story, but he did enough to show that this is where it came from. This is the source material of that story. And of course, other myths uh, that came before it were incorporated myths of the savior figure like Attis and Horus and um, you name it. it, it oh, just, Mithra also, right? Mithra was big, yes. Yeah. Um, and going back to Babylon, Tammuz and in Sumeria, it was Dumuzi. It goes all the way back and these were incorporated into it as well. And I believe um, the Council of Nicaea, they, they were instrumental in setting the foundation for what is canonical, what is not, what is acceptable, what is not, you know. Well, the, in the Council of Nicaea, that's where they determined whether Jesus was God or just a man. Yeah, that was the big question. Who was the son? Who was the savior? Uh, literally, who was the son? Right, and it was uh, 300 years after Jesus supposedly lived. So right. this is people have to put this into context. This would be like, Somebody 300 years from now saying, was Mike Williams a god or was he just a human, <laughs> you know? And 300 years from now, nobody even knows who I am. I mean, no, nobody will know who I am. Most people won't even know who I am <laughs> two weeks after I pass away. Never mind 300 years from now. And you have to put it into that context. So a group of guys got together and they had to decide. One of the objectives of that meeting was to decide whether Jesus was God or whether Jesus was just a human, a very wise prophet type of guy walking around. So you have to understand how this stuff is formulated and how it's it's put together. I'll tell you, I, I've spoken to Christians, Priscilla, and they have no idea. I'm talking about evangelicals, fundamentalists. They have no idea about the Council of Nicaea. And it's instrumental with regard to how Jesus came about. Yeah, it's staggering how much people don't know about their own religion and how much they profess in turn to know about it when they don't. You know, and that that's just one good example. Everything that my book exposes is the best example, in my opinion. <laughs> but yeah, uh, you know, a lot of things uh, are kept from a church service on purpose. They focus a lot about uh, when God says he's good when people extol God and all the rest, but I've never heard, and I went to church until I was 18, I never heard one instance of any story being brought up. You know, God, uh, hell was not uh, focused on. Mary was kind of worshipped more than Jesus. I went to a strange following. <laughs> no, no, that's actually uh, quite common in the Roman Catholic Church, where Mary is uh, is really front and center. In fact, I was watching this this show. I guess it goes back a few years ago, four or five years ago, and they did a, a poll, a survey in Rome, and the question was: list from a list of one to ten, you are the most important person in the Roman Catholic Church. So they were asking Italians. Books in, in in Rome and Italy. Who was in the top ten? Do you know Jesus was number five? <laughs> Is that right? <laughs> yeah, they were putting the saints up above Jesus. So Jesus ranked number five. I think Mary was like, uh, I think she was number one or two. So you know, she ranked higher than Jesus. So 
what you're saying is absolutely true, especially within within the realm of Catholicism, is that Jesus was never was really never emphasized to the point like like the evangelicals do today, right? You know, Jesus has to be your Lord and Savior in order for you to be yeah. saved. With the Catholics, it was like Jesus was he was there, he was a main player, you know, but there were others there were other statues I'd like to put on the front of my dashboard. Yeah, and it's <laughs> really uh ironic that Mary is so commonly placed above Jesus in importance because Mary is uh ironically the goddess figure in Christianity. And it's ironic because Satan ultimately derives from a goddess. Uh going back to Tiamat. Yeah. You know. Three Marys that were present at the crucifixion. Uh, that goes back to the Arabic goddess Trinity from from Gaza. It was um, Allah too, which uh, was a goddess, became Allah. Uh, Muhammad just masculinized her. There was Uzza and there was, uh, I can't think of the third, but it is in my book. Yeah, but there was this trinity, and that was carried over into Christianity with the three Marys. The goddess was demonized, and everything, uh, you know, that's demonic and devilish is, you know, goddess worship and, and all that nonsense. But, you know, you have a goddess figure in Christianity. Yeah, yeah. Now, this is uh, really very interesting stuff. I remember when I was looking into Christianity and the history of the church and so on, and I was doing a lot of research. I found it absolutely fascinating, very, very fascinating stuff. And uh, so I'm, I'm hoping that people are getting the right message out of this show. And again, mm -hmm. we, I will repeat it just to say that what we're trying to say here is that the terms that people are using, they need to understand a little bit more about those terms so that they're not misled and using those terms out of context that perhaps there's an agenda involved that has to do with uh, ensuring that people are using the wrong descriptors or the wrong terms to explain the types of dark types of behavior and uh, stuff that's going on in the world today. Yeah, and anything can be adaptable to Christianity because they, uh, they accumulated all these other sources and made one coherent uh, book out of it. Right. And so the Roman Catholic Church in the Vatican is still the uh, head of religion in the world. It claims to be the uh, source uh, of communication with God. Yeah, of course, there's other organizations, Buddhist and, and Taoist and, you know, other philosophies. But the overarching uh, control system, as far as religion goes today, it's, it's still the Vatican, you know, and that and they can claim that because the Bible is a conflation of a lot of older sources, you well, know. And the Vatican has an enormous amount of uh, ancient Egyptian symbology. Uh, a lot of people oh, don't sure. know that either. They don't know that, yeah. you know. Egypt uh, is thrown in there too. The goddess Isis yep. is a big part of it. Actually, the word Genesis is uh, Gen Isis or Isis, the generation of Isis, the generation of the goddess. Uh, which is Lucifer as Venus, you know. And so uh, the whole Genesis story is basically a telling of the sequestering and suppression of the goddess. Well, Priscilla, we're pushing up against uh, two hours. Is there anything else that you want to wrap up with? I just want to give out my information to people if anybody uh, wants to get into this subject more or wants to know more of any of this. Get a copy of my book. Again, it's on Amazon.com. It's called Hallowed Be Thy Name, Lucifer Origins and Revelation. You can go to my website, beautifulnightmarestudios.com, and uh, click on the Lucifer link and scroll down. There's My previous interviews are there. Some articles I've written are there. And you can link to my book through my website as well. If anybody has any questions or concerns, you can email me directly at beautifulnightmarestudios at gmail.com. And that, if you forget that, it's on my website as well. Okay, and I'll put all the links into the, uh, into the show notes so that folks can find it and take a look at your website, listen to the other interviews, and uh, email you if they have any questions. So, look, I want to say that, um, as always, 
it's uh, a great discussion. It's very thought provoking. You got my mind thinking after the first interview we did, you know, several months back, maybe it was even maybe even a year ago. Or so, but um, you'll you'll come back, Priscilla. I, you have a open invitation Definitely. to come back to talk about, you know, whatever it is that you think that uh, needs to get out there to pique uh, our audience's listening ears and see if we can get them to, um, you know, dig a little deeper into some of the stuff that up until this moment may have been even taboo or maybe they've been even scared, a little frightened uh, to dig into because of the, you know, the way it's been presented and, and indoctrinated into into the masses. Definitely. I would like to come on again. It's always a lot of fun talking with you. Yeah, I, I try. I, I learn a lot when you're on, so uh, <laughs> come back anytime. And that concludes another Sage of Quay interview, and I hope you enjoyed the discussion as much as I did. Links to my guests' websites and social media are listed in the show notes below. And as always, I'd like to thank everyone for listening and visiting the blog. You can get to the blog by typing in sageofquayradio.blogspot.com or simply head over to our hub website at sageofquay.com. Also, if you get a moment, please visit laboroflovemusic.com to listen to my album, Leaving Dystopia. And remember, live in truth and always serve creation. It's really that simple. See everyone next week. Be safe, enjoy, and God bless. It's time to breathe.